welcome everyone that's in tonight. I am Kathleen Rickus and I'm the uh, local foods coordinator for South Dakota Specialty Producers Association here in South Dakota. And we uh, planned this event as the 2020 Local Foods Conference. And it's actually the 10th anniversary of this conference. So that's kind of neat and uh, did something a little bit different with it this year. And um, we're just having a great time and really excited for this breakout session. I want to introduce uh, Stefan Mursky, and he's the Evaluation and Trials Manager with the Seed Savers Exchange. And they are an incredible organization. They're a nonprofit group out of Decorah, Iowa, that aims to conserve and promote America's food crop heritage. And they do that by collecting, growing, and sharing heirloom seeds and plants. And uh, they've been around for some time. And since 2011, they've had a program called the Citizen Science Corps. That's been a unique way to get involved with the actual work and the sharing and the saving of seeds. And uh, that is what Stefan is here to talk to us about tonight. So I'll hand it over to you, Stefan. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you, Kathleen. I'm, I'm really glad to, to be with you and to have the opportunity to talk to all of you about the ADAPT program. Um, it's, a really, it's a really interesting and a really exciting program for us. Um, and we are, we are trying to uh, build a program to scale up next year. And so um, I hope by the end of the presentation, some of you will be interested in participating. Um, but uh, yeah, as Kathleen said, I am the trials and evaluation manager at Seed Savers. I've been here for um, over nine years. And um, uh, my, my job is basically to evaluate the varieties in our seed collection um, and coordinating this this uh, science core program, the ADAPT program, is another part of my job. Um, and that, that's the focus of this talk today. And um, Kathleen gave you a little bit of background on the organization, um, but I just I want to give you a little bit more of a background in case you're not real familiar with what Seed Savers is or does um, before I jump into um, the details of the ADAPT program. So I have a PowerPoint presentation, and I am going to start screen sharing with you. Just a second here. And let's see. Going to slideshow mode. Okay, so is that, uh, is that, I, I think that's in slideshow mode now. Looks good. So, um, Kathleen uh, said what the mission of Seed Savers Exchange is, but um, just just to reiterate that, um, it, it's to um, it's it's a member supported organization, nonprofit organization, with the mission to conserve and promote North America's culturally diverse but endangered garden and food heritage for future generations by collecting, growing, and sharing heirloom seeds and plants. And a big part of our mission involves educating people um, about the value of genetic and cultural diversity um, in our food crops and connecting these people to each other through multiple networks, one of which is the ADAPT program. So Seed Savers Exchange was founded in part because of the inspiration that came from the grandparents of our co-founder, Diane Otwaley. Um, her grandparents grew a tomato, which is known as now known as the German pink tomato, and a morning glory called Grandpa Ox every year along their front porch. And shortly after Diane married and left home, she asked her grandpa if she could have some of these seeds. And when he when he gave her some of these seeds, he also told her 
that he had originally received them from his father who brought them to Iowa from Bavaria, Germany in um, the 1880s. So Diane and her husband Kent realized the, the value of these family heirloom varieties and they wanted to ensure that, that they wouldn't be lost with her grandparents' generation. So they decided to um, share the seeds with as many people as possible to, um, to ensure that the survival of them. And over time, Kent and Diane became more and more aware of the loss of these old uh, reliable varieties and agricultural diversity in general as, um, as hybrids and more commercially bred varieties were being introduced to the seed trade. So to find other gardeners who might be interested in, in saving and sharing these heirloom seeds, Kent and Diane sent letters to um, back to the land type publications like Mother Earth News saying that they have rare heirloom seeds that they would like to share with other people. And they know that there are other others out there with their own rare varieties um, and that Kent and Diane would like to start a seed exchange um, to, to be able to swap these varieties with each other. And this image just um, is uh, one of these letters in a 1975 issue of Mother Earth News. So as the seed exchange was growing, gardeners began sending seeds to Kent and Diane from all over the country. And often these gardeners were getting older and had varieties that had been in their family for generations, um, but didn't have anybody to, to pass the seeds along to. So Kent and Diane started receiving packages like this one, you know, just squash seeds tucked in the, um, some bubble wrap with a little description about uh, the variety um, and maybe a little bit about it, its, um, its stewardship history as well. So pretty soon the, the seed collection had filled up the counter of their living room office. Um, in the early 1980s, Ken and Diane received a donation of more than 1,200 different bean varieties from a collector in the New England area named John Withy. And with that donation, they, they really ran out of space. So the collection today has, has come a long way since that time. Um, the majority of, the, of our collection is in an air uh, uh, housed in airtight foil packets in our walk-in freezer, which is kept at zero degrees Fahrenheit. And we share the seeds in our collection with the general public through a seed swap called the exchange. Um, this was the original function of the organization. And, and basically the exchange is an online catalog listing all of the seeds that are available from our collection, as well as seeds from other gardeners around the country who want to share their own seeds. So we, we print a hard copy book of the exchange every year called the yearbook. Um, and this year, this is that's the cover that you're looking at. Um, in this year's yearbook, there were there are 405 individuals listing over 20,000 varieties. And that includes over 5,000 varieties from our own collection. Um, as you may or probably know, we, we also print a seed catalog every year, which we distribute to hundreds of thousands of people across the country. Um, this is the cover of the 2020 seed catalog, and it lists about 600 varieties that we sell in seed packets and in bulk quantities. Um, this is the part of the organization that most people are familiar with, but it was in fact the exchange that that was and really remains the heart of the organization. Um, as I said, I work on the evaluation program and and the, the goal of the evaluation program is to document the varieties in our collection um, by gathering information on their physical characteristics like yield size, um, growth habit, taste qualities. There's a squash um, tasting that you see there um, and uniformity um, among many other traits. So we grow about 500 varieties here on the farm every year just for evaluation. 
and we use the data that we collect to write profiles of those varieties for the exchange. So that's that's what I'm really busy doing right now up until the uh, the yearbook is is printed later in December. So we also look for things like varietal purity um, and trueness to type. Um, and, and we also scout for outstanding varieties in our collection that we may want to introduce into our seed catalog to um, to a larger um, audience. So that was a little bit of background on the organization. Um, now I'm going to get into the Community Science Corps ADAPT program, and um, I'm calling it Community Science Corps because we are in the process of changing the name. Um, it, it was the Citizen Science Corps, but we feel like Community Science Corps is more inclusive, and so we are, we're making that change. The ADAPT program really is an exciting program, um, and it plays an important role in helping us decide which varieties to introduce into our catalog from our collection. Um, the, the main purpose of the program is, uh, main purposes are to, to crowdsource data on the performance of varieties from our collection, um, to engage the public in our work, and as I mentioned, to identify outstanding varieties from our collection and introduce them through our catalog. So here at Heritage Farm, which is the name of the farm, um, the headquarters of Seed Savers Exchange, we grow hundreds of varieties from our collection every year, um, um, not only for evaluation, but of course also for seed, for regeneration growouts, as we call them. Um, and every year we're on the lookout for outstanding varieties from our collection to include in our ADAPT trials. The characteristics that we take into account um, are not only performance related, um, but also their culinary qualities. That's, that's a really important factor um, and their stewardship history. So by, by including these varieties in the ADAPT trials, we really get a good idea how well they perform in other regions of the country and how popular they are with a larger, more diverse demographic um, of the gardening and farming community. So how does the program actually work? Well, um, every year we offer a certain number of trials. Um, this year we offered six different trials, including cucumber, shell and pea, sweet pepper, melon, hot pepper, and beefsteak tomato. And people can choose whichever trials they're interested in doing. You can um, pick more than one if you'd like. Um, or what it's basically whatever you have space for. So each trial includes a certain number of varieties. Um, for example, the beef steak tomato trial this year included eight varieties. Um, one variety in each trial serves as the control. And the control is a variety that we already offer in our seed catalog um, that we have um, sales data for over many years and that we're very familiar with. Um, the control variety in this year's tomato trial was Italian heirloom, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, from this pool of varieties, participants are randomly assigned three varieties for their trial. Um, the three varieties will not necessarily include the control variety. Um, it's just completely random. So in this example, um, the three varieties are Pops Holy Land, Baker Family Heirloom, and Italian Heirloom. So as I mentioned, the the variety stewardship histories are one factor that we take into account when we decide which varieties to include in the trial. Um, one perk of participating really is learning about some of these, these heirloom varieties and their stories. Um, and I just wanted to shine a spotlight on a few of those varieties in the trials this year. Um, Pops Holy Land is a, is a variety of tomato that we're offering. And this variety was donated to Seed Savers Exchange in 2016 by Claire Cosenio 
of Ohio. And her father-in-law, Phil Cosenio, who was nicknamed Pop, um, hired an Italian stonemason to work on their front steps in the 1960s. And um, Pop persuaded him to share seeds of his prized tomato with him. So Phil grew the, this variety from the 1960s until his death in 2009. And Phil and his wife, Dorothy, use, use the tomatoes to make um, ketchup and also a, a sauce for a pizza that they baked um, every other Saturday. So Claire um, sent us a, their family recipe for a tomato salad that they made with it as well, which is the photo on the bottom left of your screen. This is another variety with a fascinating history that we included in our melon trial this year. Um, the Montreal Market Melon is a, a green fleshed melon that was uh, once grown in really large quantities in um, Montreal, Canada on the west side. Um, and that area used to be considered the fruit basket of Quebec. So the, the orchards once thrived there and there were four horse tracks that provided loads of horse manure for fertilizer for the fruit and these melons. Um, in 1881, um, an American seedsman by the name of W. Atlee Burpee, um, who you may be familiar with because Burpee seeds still exist today and is very is a, um, one of the larger seed companies. Um, in 1881, uh, Atlee Burpee um, commercialized the melon um, but during the, the melons heyday in the early 1900s, Canadian farmers would ship these by train to New York City and um, the whole New England area. And they carefully pack them in hay to avoid bruising the flesh. Um, but the melon became almost became extinct because it was replaced by more reliable and more disease resistant varieties and varieties that were more suited for shipping. Uh, but the melon was rediscovered in the USDA collection in 1997 and is now offered by a few Canadian seed companies. So we got this seed from one of those companies and we're really excited to offer it in the catalog for the first time next year. Um, it's, it's a really challenging melon to grow um, and Northeast Iowa where we're located is not um, the ideal place to be growing heirloom melons but we did have success, success with it one year and um, it was uh, an incredibly flavorful melon. And so I, the, the nickname of this melon as the caviar of cantaloupe really is, is fitting in my opinion. This is another um, well-documented heirloom variety in our collection, um, the Tony Scavo Thin Skin Pepper is a sweet roasting pepper that came from Italy with Nicholas Scavo and was grown by his son, Tony, uh, basically his entire adult life in the Des Moines, Iowa area. Um, Tony was a truck farmer and sold this pepper and, and other produce that he grew at the downtown farmer's market and um, from his yard. So after Tony, Tony died, um, his friend, Gail um, donated seeds to Seed Savers Exchange because Gail was concerned about, about losing it. Um, Gail told us that he had already lost melon seeds that his grandfather had grown, grown for 90 years because he neglected to grow it out for six or seven years and then the melon seed didn't germinate anymore. And this is just kind of a, a, an, an interesting anecdote. Um, it was just a few weeks ago that I was working in the gardens here at Seed Savers Exchange, and um, Tony Tony Scavo Jr. happened to walk by, happened to be walking around in the gardens with his wife, and um, I didn't know who it was at the time, but but uh, this man mentioned that um, his father had a variety that is now in our collection, and he told me the name of the variety, and I and I and I told. Tony Jr. that I was very familiar with this variety and that in fact it was in our ADAPT trials and people around the country were growing this variety this year. And Tony Jr. was just so, he just swelled up with, with pride at, when I told him that and he was 
um, it was just a really, a really nice thing to see. Okay, so back to um, how the program works. Um, once you've signed up for a trial, um, you'll receive a small quantity of seeds for each of the three varieties that you were randomly assigned. Um, and we send those seeds out in early March. Um, we also include plant labels, a field data sheet, um, and an instruction sheet for how to submit feedback. Um, we don't require participants to grow a certain number of, of plants. Um, if you only have room for one tomato plant of each variety, that's okay. We want to include as many people as possible in these trials, and we understand that um, space is often, often a limiting factor for people, um, especially because a lot of participants are just backyard gardeners. So, um, you know, obviously the more plants you can grow, the better, but um, just one is, is okay. Um, we just ask that you grow the, the three varieties side by side under the same conditions. And for each trial, we ask for feedback on a number of traits, which are customized for each crop type. So for example, for the tomato trial, this year, we're asking for feedback on uh, vigor, disease resistance, um, earliness, flavor, appearance, and yield. So a, a partner that's really crucial to the, to the success of the ADAPT program is a new startup company called Seedlink. And Seedlink launched in 2018, and we were one of the um, among the first organizations to, to partner with 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 Seedlink. Um, basically, Seedlink is an online platform that helps us manage the trials. Um, it it helps us organize the trials. It it helps. Um, it's a platform for collecting feedback from participants. It displays results so that um, all the participants can see them, and it's it's also um, helps build a network between participants. So um, we really like this crowdsourcing or participatory approach to, to variety testing um, that, that Seedlink fosters because it's a really key to the mission of Seed Savers Exchange as well. So this is a screenshot of, um, of what it looks like from a trial manager perspective. Um, this shot shows the trials, uh, the 2020 tomato trials and the 2019 tomato trials. And in 2020, we invited 68 people to join the trial, which involved eight different varieties, as I mentioned. And it shows that um, 61 of the 68 people that we invited accepted the trial and, um, and sent us feedback. So for, for participants, um, Seedlink really makes it easy to submit feedback. And um, a significant uh, percentage of, of our participants in these trials are, are people that are not real fluent with computers or technology. And so that, that was a concern of ours from the beginning. But Seedlink has really made a user-friendly platform. And so um, it, it, uh, people, people of all, all types and ages seem to be able to figure out how to use it fairly quickly. Um, as you can see at the top of your screen, uh, each participant ranks the three varieties that they were assigned as uh, best or worst on, on, the, on traits like vigor, disease resistance, earliness, appearance, um, and others that I mentioned before. So the reason for using this best and worst ranking system and forcing people to choose the best and worst varieties for each trait um, is to get some, some separation in the average scores. So another, another system that we've actually considered using is just a, a basic one to five scale. Um, but the disadvantage from this system, from a trial manager perspective, is that participants will often give all varieties the same or a very similar score for each of the traits. And that doesn't give much separation in the data then, and it's not real helpful for us 
for making decisions. But we do realize that uh, there are drawbacks to this best and worst system, mainly from the participant side, since it, it forces people to choose even when um, two or more varieties uh, are the same for each trait. So, you know, if Baker family heirloom and Italian heirloom both were um, equally vigorous, um, with this system, you still have to choose uh, best and worst. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really allow for these sort of nuanced decisions. Um, so we, we are looking at trying a one to five scale next year. Um, we're, we're still uh, debating whether or not to, to do that. Um, but uh, it, you can also enter planting and harvest dates through seed linked as well as comments and pictures. So the comments are really key um, to providing more nuance in your feedback. Um, and then also there's a map that shows all the participants in the trial. And that's kind of cool, make, uh, kind of get a sense of community in that way. In addition to using the website, you can also enter data directly in the field using a smartphone and a free app that Seedlink has developed. Um, the app also works offline. So if you don't have internet where you are, um, you can still use the app and enter your data in the field. And then once you get back online, the data will automatically upload to the, to the online platform. Um, another huge benefit of using SeedLinked is that the results are immediately displayed and everybody in the trial can view them. Um, you can you can sort the results by individual individual traits like flavor or vigor, um, disease resistance, etc. Um, or you can view them all together. So I just want to take you uh, briefly through the results of some of our trials in 2020. Um, and these results are literally just in our deadline for submitting results was November 1st. And so um, I've just I've just looked at them very quickly and, and you're, you're getting um, an, an early look at them too. So this is a screenshot of our 2020 tomato trial um, in quantitative terms on a scale of one to five. So um, the way SeedLink works on the back end is that um, it translates a, a best score to a five and a worst score to a one. And then the variety that was neither best nor worst gets a three. Um, so that's how this uh, graph is generated and these numbers are, are, um, are averaged. Um, but at the top of your screen, you can see some information about the trial. Um, the completion rate was about 60%, um, which uh, seems to be pretty consistent for a lot of our trials. We have a hard time getting above 60%. Um, and, and what you're looking at right here is a graph of the average scores for um, all of the traits combined. And, and, and for all of all of the participants and um, all of across all hardiness zones as well. Um, as I said, you can filter individual traits and other metrics, um, which I'll show you in just a minute. Another question that seed linked asks is whether or not participants would want to grow the variety again. Um, and you can see the results of that on the left side of your screen for the tomato trial. Uh, the platform, uh, so, so each, each of those pies, the, the green shows the number of participants um, that uh, would grow the variety again, and the red is the fraction of participants who would not. Um, the platform also has space for growers to submit comments and photos. And we found comments to be really helpful in analyzing the data. Um, and I just I just pulled this comment off of the results uh, because it's it's really kind of it's a great comment. It's Caroline was really thorough with her trials, um, and I just wanted to share it, uh, so what, what her feedback for this for for the Italian heirloom variety. She, she says, 
how it grieves me to give Italian heirloom the worst flavor rating because Italian heirloom has been a staple in my garden for seven years. I was astounded that I liked the taste of both MC Stapy and Baker Family Heirloom more than Italian heirloom this year. I really hope my flavor review doesn't deflate the character of Italian heirloom because it really is a stunning tomato. So I just, I love that comment. And, um, and, and a lot of our participants write really detailed comments, which are very helpful for us. Um, this, these are the results of the 2020 sweet pepper trial. Again, showing the average score for all the traits for all participants. Um, you can see that uh, second from the right, totally sweet Italian had the highest average score overall among all participants. Um, and that was actually our control variety, which means that we are, it's, it's in the catalog and we've offered it in the catalog for many years. The control varieties are, are often hard to beat and they're in our catalog for a reason. Um, the, the Tony Scavo thin skin pepper that I talked about earlier in the presentation is um, on the on the far right side, and you can see it it kind of finished in the middle of the pack overall. These are the results of this year's cucumber trial. Um, as you can see, white McNeely it, uh, had the highest overall average score. And on the far left side, double yield, yield was our control variety. So it actually outperformed that one. This is this shows the results of our shelling pea trial this year. Um, Walter Burr had the highest average overall score. And Green Arrow, um, which is was our control variety on the far left side, um, finished kind of a distant third. And these are the results of our hot pepper trial. Um, Georgia Flame had the highest average score. And again, that was our control variety <clears throat> for this trial. The completion rate for the hot pepper trial was significantly lower than um, our other trials at just, uh, just above 40%. And I'm not quite sure why that is, but it may have something to do with the fact that they were all fairly pungent. People may have underestimated how hot these peppers are. And this is this shows the results of the melon trial. And there was a tie for highest score between a variety called Dago and Spear. And as you can see, Montreal Market, that the variety from Canada, Canada that I talked about earlier, finished way at the bottom with a 1.2 average score which um, to be honest was not really a surprise because it's such a difficult melon to grow. Um, and I think that's just a reflection of the fact that a lot of people had either grow out failures or the, the, their Montreal market crop um, just got disease and the fruits just didn't um, develop as they should have in, the, in, a, in a more favorable year or, or um, climate. So the completion rate for our melon trial is also fairly low at below 40%. Um, and again, that's just because a lot of these heirloom melons are really challenging to grow. They just don't have the disease resistance that more modern varieties do. Um, and they're, they're fairly long season. Um, so actually, I thought I would take a break from this presentation and play around on the seed linked platform live for you here um, so that you can kind of get a, a feel for for how it works as a as a participant. Um, I think I think it'll be a, more enlightening than just seeing some screenshots. So I'm going to exit this and This is what the platform looks like online. Um, it, it looks a little bit different, quite a bit different if you're using the app in the field on your smartphone. Stefan, I'm not sure we're seeing the right screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, let's see here. 
if you drag your browser over to your other screen. There we go. Okay. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, right. So this, so this is what it looks like um, online on your computer. And here is sort of the, the main menu. Um, and if you click on my trials, then you can see all of the trials that are ongoing um, that I currently have that are that are open that are not completed yet. And then on the right hand side over here are the ones that are completed. And if I click on this results button for the 2020 tomato trial, it takes us to this screen. And uh, probably looks familiar from my slides. Um, so at the top here, you can actually filter for um, for any individual traits, or you can select all of them. So what we're looking at right now are the results for all of the traits um, combined, so the overall average. But if I were to just select flavor, we could see the results for that. And um, MC Stapy had, as Kathleen said in her comment, had really good flavor. Um, we can search or filter for just yield if we want. And that, that shows us these results. So it's a really pretty dynamic platform um, and, and very user friendly. Um, in addition to filtering for individual traits, we can also filter for um, type of participant. So when you register through the Seedlink website, um, you will put in some personal information about yourself, including you know, whether you're a farmer or a gardener, um, as well as other information like um, your hardiness zone, um, your address, and that all that passport type data is really useful in um, in uh, just uh, being able to filter for for those different uh, metrics. So we can select um, gardener here, and this you know if you're if you're a gardener, you may not be interested in how the variety does on a larger scale in farms. You may just want to know how it does in in gardens, and that's that's what we're seeing here. Um, if you're a farmer, we, we tend not to have nearly as many farmers participate in our trials just because the um, our community just at Seed Savers consists of a lot of uh, gardeners. So um, when I filtered for farmer here, you can see that it only shows five varieties out of the eight total in the trial, and that's because um, they're just there were three varieties that were not grown by somebody who considered themselves a farmer. Um, and then, um, in addition, you can filter for your hardiness zone. So if I just wanted to see results for zone 4B, which is uh, our zone here at Heritage Farm, um, I can see that. And so this really gives you good information on the performance of these varieties for your region and um, your specific situation. And then on the right side here is where you can view people's comments and photographs that they uploaded. So if we want to see the comments for Baker Family Heirloom, um, here they are. Again, Caroline wrote really long comments. But these are these are really helpful um, because, as I said, this best worst rating system doesn't give uh, all that much nuance. And then we can look at photos that were uploaded. So it's it's a really it's a really dynamic platform and very user friendly and. Um, as I said, Seedlink has just been crucial to the success of the ADAPT program, and um, we've we've just co-evolved together since Seedlink um, first launched in 2018, which um, 
which makes it really well tailored to our ADAPT trials. So I am going to go back into presentation mode. So this slide shows the number of ADAPT participants um, by trial this year. And as you can see, Sweet Pepper was our most popular trial with 64 participants, um, 61 for the tomato trial, 60 for the cucumbers, 53 for shelling peas, 42 for the hot pepper, and 36 for the melons. And this is a map that shows participation by location. So we do have a, a few people in Canada that join our trials most uh, most years. And then, um, you know, uh, people are spread out across the whole country, which is which really give, gives us good data on um, regional adaptability of these varieties. Um, you can see that there is a lot of representation in Wisconsin and Indiana. And that's because we partnered with um, a couple of large master gardener groups in those states. And um, we, we really enjoy working with um, gardening organizations like master gardeners or other clubs. Um, it's, it's a really fun thing to do. So we, we encourage that. Um, so what do, we, what do we do with all this data? I talked about that briefly earlier on. Um, but here at Seed Savers Exchange, we have what we call um, a, a collection to catalog committee, and that's an interdepartmental committee um, that basically decides which varieties from our collection end up in our seed catalog. Um, and the information from the ADAPT program and the evaluation program here at Heritage Farm um, are really useful in informing those decisions. Um, it, it is a multi-year process to introduce a variety to the catalog because it in, entails multiple years of trialing and then um, years of seed production to scale up from just a few seeds that somebody donated to us, you know, in, in some bubble wrap to um, to the buckets of seed that we actually need for a run in our catalog. But this this community science model of trialing really ensures that the varieties that end up in our catalog are top quality. Um, and that they will be popular among gardeners and farmers around the country. That's a picture of uh, one of our production gardens. Um, every year we introduce roughly a dozen varieties into our catalog from our collection. Um, and you're looking at a spread from this year's catalog of um, some of those some of those new introductions. Um, many of these varieties have been tested through the ADAPT program, um, and they really just offer a, a glimpse into the amazing diversity in our collection. Um, of course, through the seed exchange, you can access thousands more varieties, um, which may one day end up in our catalog. Um, I just want to uh, give one example of how ADAPT informs our decisions. Um, last year, we offered a lettuce trial with seven different varieties, and the top two performing varieties were Americana Sure Brown and All Cream. Um, and we decided to put those two varieties in production this year, and we hope to sell them through our catalog in the near future. So uh, yeah, the benefits of this community science or crowdsourcing approach really goes way beyond um, Seed Savers Exchange's catalog and our bottom line. Um, the benefits for growers are um, higher profit, lower risk, and um, more choice in, in seed catalogs. And for plant breeders and seed companies like us, this approach gives us greater efficiency in, in making decisions and more variety knowledge and the ability to um, identify and offer locally adapted varieties. Um, and then of course, higher profits as well. So um, 
you know, as a result, local food systems really benefit from this structure in terms of uh, more resiliency, um, greater crop diversity, more transparency in the seed economy, and um, it's just a more democratic seed economy as well. So we really think it's a win-win situation for everybody. And we're, we're really excited to continue this partnership with Seedlink and raise awareness um, about the program. So um, we are trying to scale up the ADAPT program next year. Um, we had about 120 participants this year, which um, was a similar number to, <clears throat> to last year. Um, next year, we're hoping to have 250 or more participants. Um, so I just want to say that if you'd like to join us, please reach out. Um, you'll get access to rare, unique varieties from our collection that um, we think are really special and performed well here on the farm. And um, you'll also be helping us preserve crop diversity and um, our cultural heritage. So um, thanks so much for listening. And um, if you'd like to reach out, um, my contact information is on the bottom left of your screen. Um, you can send me an email or give me a call. So that's about all I have. Um, Thank you, Stefan. I just had a quick question. I uh, was looking at all the different varieties of, of things, the different crops you can grow. How many different things could you possibly grow with this program? It looks like quite a few. Yeah, so we offered six trials this year. Um, and if you signed up for all six of them, then you would you would get um, 18 total varieties because you'd be getting three varieties from each trial. Um, so yeah, you could potentially grow 18 different varieties. Wow. Yeah, and, and we have yet to decide um, what trials we'll be offering next year and how many varieties are in those trials. Um, but we're, 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 we're we will um, have that have that information by the end of December, and we typically s send out um, send out those details to people in at the beginning of the new year. So I think next year we're actually going to be offering more trials um, because we have heard from uh, previous participants that they they would like more choice. And um, of course, um, if we have more participants next year, then um, then we feel like we can offer more trials and um, we'd still get enough data on all those varieties um, to be useful. So. More trials in terms of more different choices of, of fruits and vegetables that you could. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. More trials. Yeah. Different, uh, more, more crop types, basically. So we, we would probably um, offer a tomato trial next year again and sweet pepper, the really popular ones, um, yeah. get a bean as well and, and lettuce. Um, but then on top of that, we we probably we we may offer some some more minor crop types that um, we'd like to get more varieties of in our catalog. So we're we're considering things like um, maybe mustard greens or cow peas um, or lima beans um, or some other brassicas potentially. So great. And you can, so you can request these um, and kind of sign up at any time, ex except for the tomatoes, you obviously have to put in by early, by March. Yeah, so so we, we do have a deadline for signing up and um, the cutoff date is March 1st of next year. Um, and that's just so that it, um, it's easier on our side for us to, to cut it off and then just send out all the seeds at once. And it is a little bit challenging with this program because um, people are spread out all over the country and people need their seeds at different times. The people in the North and South Dakota would need to start their tomato seeds probably in early February. Yeah. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, we probably wouldn't be able to get tomato seeds out that early, but we're hoping that, um, you know, um, by early March, it's not too late for the majority of people. Oh yeah, I think around here, March is, is fine. I, 
like mid March. Oh. Starting inside, yeah, to start from seed, not not any too early. I've always heard because you don't want to get too big okay. in those little, you know. So I think that's a that's great timing. So it's it's fun. It it looks like a lot of fun. I mean, it looks. I might be kind of intimidated for some things, <laughs> like like the tomatoes. I never have any luck with tomatoes, but some things, I mean, it'd be really cool to see all the different varieties of a basil or a lettuce that you could grow. And I mean, those are so easy to grow. I mean, you could get uh, a few different varieties of each of those and, and just be watching them, kind of observing them all summer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we did offer a basil trial last year, and a lot of people signed up for both the tomato and the basil trial. And um, there yeah, you go. It, it, it shouldn't be intimidating. Um, we try to make it as, as easy as possible for people. And like I said, we don't require you to grow any number of plants or in any specific environment. Um, you know, there are crop failures all the time. And um, a lot of these heirloom varieties are, are just more challenging to grow than, than people are accustomed to. And so we recognize that and, um, and that's okay. That's okay. That's part of, part of the benefit of the crowdsourcing approach is that if you have enough people participate, um, you're, you're going to get some data in the end. And yeah. uh, that's, that's yeah. what the trial is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Well, I have a poll that's kind of coming up, just kind of wrapping some things up. And you've got your info up so that people can contact you if they want to get more information. And I'd love to thank you, Stefan, for being here tonight and for spending um, your evening with us and telling us about this really, really important and, and sometimes often overlooked part of, um, you know, creating change in our food systems. You know, you have to have something to grow, <laughs> to uh, create that change and to um, shrink a, a food system. If, if the, so I think that, um, it's interesting learning and exploring all of those seed saving techniques and varieties and and I hope I can visit the the farm out in Iowa someday. Absolutely. <laughs> invite everybody to, to come and visit. It's this year obviously was a little different, um, but hopefully next year um, we'll we'll be we'll be more open. Um, but take a lot of visitors and stuff. Yeah, we do. We've, we've got a visitor center. We've got display gardens around the visitor center. Um, one of our main evaluation gardens is right next to the visitor center. So you can tour that. And that's, there's a lot of uh, interactive aspects to that. Um, it's a little more challenging to, to see our other gardens around the farm because they are isolated from each other and scattered, but um, they're, it's a beautiful farm. There are plenty of trails to hike around and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice destination. So please come out and visit. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, and we'll uh, keep up with your work, certainly from uh, specialty producers and, and send uh, people your way to grow this program. So Everyone, we've got a little bit of a break and we're going to um, have a chef's demo again tonight coming up. So you'll log out of this and hop on the link that we've got provided in the chat and um, we'll see you in about, um, about 15 minutes for that. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you so much.